Good evening and a very warm welcome from Women in Security, Conflict Management and Peace Initiative of the Foundation for Universal Responsibility to the discussion, Multiple Realities, Muslim Women, Culture and Rights. Welcome back to the second edition of the Book Cafe in collaboration with Project Demilitarize. As many of you know, Book Cafe is a bi-monthly online discussion series of WISCOM that brings together university students, early career researchers and practitioners to share their ideas and insights. Each discussion takes up texts, arguments, questions from a chosen text to facilitate and trigger discussion. It also provides an opportunity for scholars to share their research that broadly follows under the same theme. So Project Demilitarize was incubated under the EU-funded Ally Project to understand the discourses on militarism in South Asia. Project Demilitarize in 2021 launched its flagship course on gender and militarism with over 250 participants all over the region. Today, as an independent collective, it curates feminist reading lists and hosts conversations on pertinent themes. Well, the companion text for today is Professor Leela Abu Lughod's Do Muslim Women Need Saving? Abu Lughod is a Palestinian American anthropologist, and this book is a critique of the discursive representation of Muslim women in American media, in popular fiction, and rhetoric. Written in the wake of 9 11 post war terror, Abu Lughod unpacks the hegemony of human rights intervention and the discourse of humanitarian intervention or human rights in the name of saving Muslim women. She further argues how the stereotype of oppressed Muslim women is used to advance other objectives of strategic national interest, global capital interests, and individual self-interest leading to destructive wars, xenophobia, and lucrative humanitarianism. So the emphasis here is to see individual lives within their contextual specificity and go beyond just the matter of the question of rights. So the book raises multiple questions, problematizing this language of agency, empowerment, freedom, choice, consent. And interestingly, similar questions are currently being debated upon in our context in the wake of triple talaq ban, and more recently, the ban on hijab imposed in the Karnataka educational institutions. So the High Court decision upholding the ban and the ongoing Supreme Court proceedings have led to articles, editorials, news debates, and webinars on restoring rights, choice, equality, and again, the point about saving Muslim women from the patriarchal religious oppression. So I wish to place a couple of things on the table, and I will leave the expert moderator and the panel of researchers to comment and reflect on this issue and their socio-political implications. So let's begin with the times we are living in. These are hyper-connected and hyper-abbreviated times with the rise in hate speech and polarization. So the question is, how do we understand these times? How do we understand the multiple realities? How do we encapsulate the nuances of the gendered realities we're living in? Abu Lughod problematizes the homogenized subcategory of Muslim women. Can we really then speak about a Muslim women question in the Indian context? And, you know, we are addressing questions of gender justice in all the cases of the courts, the proceedings, the legal framework. Now, the question would then be, is legal framework or a recourse to legal institutions sufficient to ensure addressing the structural injustices that women face again in terms of the multiple realities and the complex worlds we live in. So Abu Lughod suggests that we look at the question of right, choice, agency, freedom through the lenses and the perspectives of those who suffer injustice, resist and reclaim agency. Now in a context where spaces for dialogue, where spaces and conversations where we listen to each other are really depleting, I believe this dialogue is an exhortation to listen to the voices, to listen to the narratives and experiential realities. And I do look forward to the speakers shedding some light on these concerns. So I would now like to actually welcome our panelists and our moderator for today. So the moderator for today's uh, edition of the Book Cafe is Amber Ahmed, and the speakers are Hamida Sayed and Sarah Athair. 
Mesambar Ahmed is associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Kamla Nehru College, Delhi University. She previously taught journalism and political science at Lady Shiram College, Delhi University. She specializes in political theory and feminist politics and has written and spoken on issues of rights, gender and governance. Her articles have been published in leading newspapers in the country, including the Hindustan Times and the Outlook magazine. And I'm really, really eternally grateful for, to Professor Amber Ahmed to actually accept our invitation to moderate and facilitate uh, this dialogue. So before I invite Professor Amber Ahmed to take over, I would also like to just uh, familiarize all of us with the structure of the panel discussion we have planned. So we begin with Professor Amber Ahmed sharing some light on the, on the book, some reflections and comments and insights on that. And then we have presentations by the young speakers. Then we'd invite Ma'am to also share her questions on those presentations. And we open up the dialogues to a section we call as reflections and resonances, where it's, it's open to all of us to ask questions, to share our comments, to share experiences and all. And a couple of housekeeping rules to all of us is the idea is of a book cafe where all of us not just see each other, but also listen to each other. So I'd request all of you to keep your cameras on and mute your audios. And I hope all of you ask as many questions as possible. So thank you so much and over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Akashreen. I hope I'm audible. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Viscom for inviting me uh, for this session. And uh, it's certainly a topic that is not just very pertinent, but also something that I have engaged with over a period of time. So I'm very happy and excited to be here. So uh, without any further delay, I want to first uh, just uh, give a, a general sense of the issue from how I see it. And then I will move on to introduce are two researchers and then they will make their presentations followed by the question answer session. So this entire question of saving Muslim women, this is by no means a question that is new. In the early 20th century, in 1906 to be precise, uh, the proceedings of the Presbyterian Women's Missionary Conference, which was held in Cairo, were published as a collection that came to be titled as Our Muslim Sisters, a cry of need from lands of darkness interpreted by those who heard it. The subtitle itself is quite, um, one could say self-explanatory. Now, uh, this was a book edited by Annie Sommer and Samuel Zem Zwemer. This was a collection of many chapters on the sad plight of the Mohammedan women as they were then known. And it contained accounts of women ranging from Egypt, Egypt to Indonesia. The primary themes, included the ignorance of the Muslim woman, the lack of love in her marriage, her subjection to the practices of seclusion, polygamy and veiling, the latter seen in particular as indicative of her evident low status in society. The title of the work very clearly revealed the primary function of the book. And in the introduction of the book itself, it is claimed that the book is an indictment as well as an appeal, an indictment of the Muslim societies that oppress women and an appeal to Christian womanhood to right these wrongs and enlighten this darkness by sacrifice and service. Now, an indictment, this book certainly is, particularly where it focuses on certain practices Veiling, for instance, on the very first page of the introduction itself, the veil finds a mention as the culprit for the degradation of the Muslim society. And I quote, in Arabia, before the advent of Islam, it was customary to bury female infants alive. Muhammad improved on the barbaric custom and discovered a way by which all females could be buried alive and yet live on, namely the veil. Now, the veil in this narrative appears as unrelieved evil, a system of keeping women secluded, ignorant, and ha under harsh control. The harem is the device of keeping them imprisoned, while the veil is the means to render them insignificant and invisible. Now, the reason behind the backwardness of the uh, Muslim society in general is also linked to this practice, and it is said, I quote from the book, it was Islam that forever withdrew from Oriental society, the bright, refining, elevating influence of women by burying her alive behind the veil and lattice of the harem. In addition, it is argued that the plight of women is the same in all Muslim societies. 
be it India, Persia, Arabia, Africa, and other Mohammedan lands. And again, I'm quoting from the book, uh, be it India, Persia, Arabia, Africa, and other Mohammedan lands, it's the same everywhere. And that the solution lies in taking to these women the message of the savior. Apart from the generalization regarding the uniformly oppressive nature of Islam, it was also argued that women living in Islamic societies cannot hear unless they are told and that they cannot save themselves. The task of saving them lies with the Christian women. The passivity and lack of knowledge that is attributed to the women, to the women is again directly linked to the veil and the system of harem that degrades women and makes them servilely dependent. The imposition of the veil and harem on women was seen as indication of Islam's inadequacy as a moral force to alleviate the lewdness and sensuality of the Arab society during the Prophet's time. Juxtaposed with this is the moral superiority of the Christian world and the task of saving the souls of the heathen could serve as also as a powerful justification for colonialism. The attack here is two-pronged. Women are not simply imprisoned in harems and rendered insignificant by the veil, but this seclusion and constant company of women only being around women is assumed that they are beyond the control of men in certain ways, and hence it might lead to a certain laxity of morals. So it was not just a question of saving Muslim women from the corporeal degradation, but also salvaging their benighted souls. Using the status of women as the tool to indicate the inferiority of the colonized became a very tried and tested strategy that found resonance in many colonial projects, irrespective of the nature of society, religious belief prevalent and the geographical situation of the colony. So there are these certain kinds of binaries of darkness and lightness of civilization and savagery of the, those who need saving and those who are going to be the saviors. Laila Abu Lokod, the author of the book that is under discussion today has written that Western Christian women at the turn of the century thus saw themselves as voicing what Muslim women cannot or amplifying the stifled voices of these others in the service of Christian salvation. This, of course, is in Victorian times when women did not have the vote, were rarely seen in the public sphere, and were supposed to have been angels in the house. So this, uh, I, I wanted to share uh, the certain ex excerpts from this book and place it in front of you to frame a certain set of questions that are necessary, uh, so a certain degree of problematization needs to be done regarding this entire question and project of saving Muslim women. First of all, the first question is, who is this Muslim woman that we are talking about? The degree of homogenization uh, that, that is implicitly present when the Muslim woman and her status is being debated completely glosses over the uh, infinite variety that we will find across societies, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, sectarian differences, so that uh, there are multiple sects within Islam, so there are sectarian differences, whether it is in terms of geographical specificities, whether it is in terms of the cultural background of those societies and how over a period of time, religious practices have in a sense become mixed up with the cultural practices of whatever part of the world we are talking about. So it seems in many of these narratives of saving Muslim women, it seems that we have not really moved very far from what was being said in 1906 about the Muslim woman ranging from Egypt to Indonesia and everything that falls in between. That Muslim women, it does not matter in what part of the world that Muslim woman resides because the defining feature of her life, the defining feature of her existence is the fact that she's a victim of Islamic patriarchy. So it does not matter where she resides, what is her specific situation, social, economic, cultural, or otherwise. So that is one question, that when we speak about the Muslim woman, which Muslim woman are we talking of saving? The second question, which is very significant here, is the question, do they need saving? And what exactly is it that they are being saved from? Now, again, as I mentioned, that there is widespread agreement that Muslim women, while all women may have been victims of patriarchy, somehow there is an assumption that many of them appear to have uh, overcome it and that now it is primarily Muslim women who need to be saved from Islamic patriarchy in particular. So uh, Leila Abu Lokod mentions in her book that there is an 
huge readership out there. There's a huge audience out there for narratives that present, according to Abu Logod, she hyphenates it. She said, not just a graphic accounts of misery, but what she terms pornographic accounts of misery. Because there is almost, it's almost like uh, uh, there's pleasure being derived out of these accounts of misery and uh, the, the lack of um, agency that is attributed to Muslim women across the globe. Now, uh, let me here also state something that patriarchy functions in very different ways in different cultural settings, but it is more or less ubiquitous. Now, uh, by no means can it be said that Muslim women do not encounter patriarchy, but somehow when the question comes to Muslim women, it, it is assumed that they are victims of a very specific and particular kind of brutal patriarchy that can be linked back to Islam. All other factors, all other forms of subjugation are not taken into account. Other factors that may be contributing to a particular kind of situation are not taken into account. There is very little recognition also that many forms of subjugation may be very new, may be a consequence of the circumstances brought about by factors that are not directly attributable to religious tradition, but to other factors as well. This is not something that is generally taken into account. So for example, Lela Abu Lokot quotes Denise Candioti, who says that what to Western eyes looks like tradition is in many instances, the manifestation of new and more brutal forms of subjugation of the weak made possible by a criminal economy, total lack of security, erosion of bonds of trust and solidarity that were tested to the limit by war, social upheaval and poverty. So for instance, the situation of, let us say, uh, Afghan women under the Taliban is not something that can purely be understood only with a reference to Islam as is generally the uh, practice to do so, without understanding the political economic background, the history of how the Taliban came up in the first, phase, first place, how they were propped up by America, etc. Other than that, as part of this question, one more thing that we need to look at is, what are they being saved from? Again, here we see a kind of like oppositional binary between the West and the Muslim world, between uh, you know uh, civilization and savage, savagery, between being uh, victims of patriarchy versus being saved and so on. Now here again, the question is that if the Muslim woman is in a predicament, part of that predicament may well derive from certain traditions of a society, or it may derive from the kind, the way in which the particular version of Islam that is prevalent in that society, etc. But at the same time, they may simultaneously also they are not they, they can be and they actually are victims of economic circumstances, warfare, and other factors beyond their control. So Lela Abu Logoth writes in her book that she says that when I receive petitions regarding you know, op uh, oppression of women, uh, she says, I'm a little hesitant about signing all these petitions because I do not usually find myself in political company with the likes of Hollywood celebrities. I had never received a petition from such women defending the right of Palestinian women to safety from Israeli bombing or daily harassment at checkpoints. That's also part of the daily experience of Muslim women. Asking the United States to reconsider its support for a government that has dispossessed them. Close them, out of, close them out from work and citizenship rights and refuse them the most basic freedoms. Maybe some of these same people were signing petitions against sensational cultural practices. For example, to save African women from genital cutting or Indian women from dowry deaths. However, I do not think it would be as easy to mobilize so many of these American and European women if it were not a case of Muslim men oppressing Muslim women. Women of cover, the term that had been coined by Laura Bush, women of cover for whom they can feel sorry and in relation to whom they can feel smugly superior. So she's also pointing out that when it comes to the predicament and the problems that are faced by Muslim women, even if we take that term at face value without problematizing it, it immediately raises the question that which Muslim woman needs saving? The Muslim woman who's daily being harassed by the Israeli forces at checkpoints or who sees her son's brain splattered on the sidewalk as a consequence of Israeli gunfire, she is 
not the ideal victim who needs to be saved. The Muslim woman who actually needs saving is the woman who can be projected as somebody who is a mute victim of Islamic patriarchy. Now, a third question that arises here is the question, this is the third and final question, who will save them? To whom, on whom does this task of going and rescuing this, the, the Muslim women fall. The, implicit, the implicit assumption here is that the saviors are also in an enviable, uh, enviable position of having thrown off all fetters and all chains and of being unarguably better off. So uh, there is an automatic assumption that women in other parts of the world, women who don't con constitute this homogeneous category of Muslim women are especially women residing in the first world, are women who are in a position where they can act as saviors, right? Now, by no means am I, am I belittling the importance of the liberal rights that may allow agency, are at least on paper, but we all know perfectly well that there is no part of the world that can actually claim that they have been able to give something as simple as, uh, equal wages to all women residing within their borders, or the fact that uh, there continues to be an unequal distribution of domestic labor across the globe. It does not matter whether we are talking about the first world or the third world. So in that sense, there is this implicit assumption that vic the victims of patriarchy in the contemporary world are largely Muslim women, while most other women are in a position that is much better. Also here, there is another assumption that underpins this entire project that certain desires are a priori, they don't need to be questioned. A particular set of liberatory goals associated with Western feminism, Western way of life are worthy of pursuit. Uh, see, the point is that these are goals that are obviously very attractive for those who wish to pursue them, but they are not the only goals that can lead to a satisfying life depending on the person we are looking at. So um, this assumption that there is only a certain clearly defined set of goals that alone are worthy of pursuit is highly problematic because there is also here, there is also here the implicit assumption that for instance, that I just want to read out something, please bear with me. There is here an implicit assumption that, uh, for example, regarding the veiled woman, there is an understanding that while one could give an audience to the idea that a woman could possibly be veiling out of her own will, it may be a choice that she's exercising, those who do listen attentively to the voices of veiled women do not ultimately find Muslim women's arguments for the meaning of covering persuasive. They remain convinced that a satisfying and fulfilling life in the veil is still an oppressed life because it is something that is being judged against the parameters that they have set out for their own life. Now, that is something that we need to take a look at as well. In addition, one more thing here is that when we ask the question of who will save them, there is also the implicit assumption that these women are incapable of any agency, they are incapable of any kind of resistance, they are incapable of deciding for themselves what direction they wish to give their lives, how they wish to live their lives, what role do they wish to give to religious faith in their lives, etc. So in this kind of a discourse, the only agency allowed to the Muslim woman, particularly the veiled woman, is to assess assert on her behalf that her veiled body is automatically a desperate plea for outside intervention to free her from the confines of social and religious convention. Veiled women are apparently so immobilized by the significations of their clothing that the only statement that they could possibly be making is a kind of inquiate plea for rescue. So uh, one final point before I wrap up and I hand over to the others, the point that Laila Abu Logot makes about smug superiority. She says that those who are in positions of being saviors, in this narrative, there is inevitably the tendency to gloss over the deficiencies of one's own society as relatively less uh, brutal, or relatively less harmful in comparison to the more lethal forms of patriarchy that Western women are saving Muslim women from. 
Uh, Anne Norton's work is very interesting in this regard. Anne Norton has written extensively about uh, how the whale has served in the West uh, as in the East, both to attract and repel the gays. She says that it attracts our gays to Arab domination of women. It distracts it from an examination of the domination of women in the West. During the Gulf War, the image of the veiled Arab woman was countered by that of the Western woman in uniform. The uniform was presented as erasing not individuality, but gender difference and affirming equality. So it was a juxtaposition, a deliberate juxtaposition that on the one hand, you have a veiled woman, which seemed an erasure of identity. On the other hand, you have a woman in uniform, which seemed to signify her gender equality. Now, what is, according to the author, what is really veiled here is the persistence of gender inequality in America and veiled inequalities among male, amongst male and female soldiers within the military. Now, uh, so these were some of the questions that I wanted to flag that when we speak about saving Muslim women, which Muslim women are we speaking about? The second question, do they need saving and what are they being saved for? They are only being, um, the, uh, the saviors are only interested in saving them when they are being saved from Islamic patriarchy. And uh, if it comes to other issues, structural issues of economy, warfare, uh, uh, support to puppet regimes or occupation of Palestine, in those instances, she's not the ideal victim who really requires saving. Uh, then the final question, who will save them? Obviously, those who are in a position of superiority over and above them in terms of being the enviable position of having escaped all forms of patriarchy, or at least that is how it is assumed. And also the assumption that there are only a particular set of goals that are worthy of pursuit. Any deviation from those set of goals cannot ever lead to a satisfying or fulfilled life. Uh, thank you. I would now like to take this opportunity to, to introduce uh, our two speakers who will be presenting their research and their thoughts. Uh, Hamida Sayed. Hamida is a freelance journalist. She works as an independent consultant for Breakthroughs Gender Sensitive Training Program which trains stakeholders contributing to ending violence against women. She also works with She for Change, a collaborative feminist forum to address gender biases in media through training, research, and advocacy of women's issues. Co-founder of Dignity Indifference, a youth-led initiative to address hate speech and dignified exchange of ideas and opinions. She has previously worked for News Laundry, Free Press Kashmir, and the Jalal Foundation. Hamida recently completed her master's in conflict analysis and peace building from the Nelson Mandela Center, Jamia Milia Islamia. Welcome, Hamida. Uh, I would now like to introduce Sara Athar. Sara is an independent researcher, activist, writer, and architect with an active interest in identity, religion, and left political developments, especially in India. Her research interests lie in the intersection of urban spatial segregation and state violence in the context of Indian Muslims. Her recent publications include The Role of the West in the Plight of Indian Muslims in TRT World and also Politics of Saving Muslim Women in Maktoub Media. She has previously written for The Wire, TRT World, and Maktoub Media. And she has a master's degree in architecture from Steddleshield University, Frankfurt. Over to you, Hamida. Thank you, Professor uh, Amber Ahmed, for such a powerful half hour presentation on uh, do Muslim women need saving? I think this is uh, a question that I've asked myself uh, over the years, the more I've tried to go through uh, the experiences that I have. And I'd like to share some of those experiences here. I'm really humbled to have this space with uh, 98 others. Um, and I think uh, this is the kind of space where uh, it's important to share such experiences. So I come from the Shia minority community of Kashmir. Uh, I was born and brought up in Saudi Arabia, which if uh, you don't have an idea about is predominantly a uh, Wahhabi sectarian country. So there's an age old um, issue that goes between Wahhabis and Shias. And it culminates and boils down to the point where um, there were times in my life where I've had to um, hide the fact that I was from the Shia minority. So there's this particular uh, commemoration that we uh, do when 
uh, as Shias, and uh, that comes from commemorating the grandson of the Prophet, Imam Hussein, who was killed in Karbala, and he was killed during the month of Muharram. And as commemoration, we beat our chests. So as a kid, when you're beating your chest and you're beating it really, really fast and you're beating it really, really hard, you're bound to have a lot of red marks on your chest. Um, I was, I think, seven or eight years old and I went to school uh, with those red marks on my chest after commemorating the night before. And the teacher pulled me uh, after the homeroom class and she said, what are those red marks? You don't, th th this doesn't make sense. And I was like, she, and then she thought that my mother was um, physically assaulting me. And I said, no, no, uh, this is because I'm a Shia. And she said, you're a Shia. Um, let's go to the principal. This is unacceptable. Uh, and I was surprised. I was extremely shocked because I thought that this was um, a normal practice. And this was a practice that every Muslim woman did. The principal was also actually uh, a Shia. And when she got to know that there were red marks all across my chest and I had been caught, she sent the teacher away uh, in a diplomatic way. And then she took me aside and she said, you're not supposed to show this here. Hasn't your mother taught you anything? Should I call her and tell her that you haven't been keeping the secret? And I said, why is this a secret? She said, because people don't understand. You're part, you're part of a community which is not accepted, even within the Muslim community. That was my first experience, uh, my first proper experience, realizing that I am not part of the entire Muslim women space in any way. 13 years later, when I shifted to Kashmir, when I migrated into my hometown and I was introduced uh, into a new school, the first question that was asked to me by a guy uh, who was my classmate was like, are you Shia or Sunni? Because your name is Hamida Sayyid and Sayyids are usually Shia. And by that time, my mother had taught me carefully taught me to keep my identity safe, to which I said that, no, I'm Muslim. Why is it important uh, for you to understand whether or not I'm Shia or Sunni? To which he realized, because at that point of time, unity was more important. Uh, he said, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Of course, you know, you would want to uh, consider yourself as a Muslim rather than putting yourself under any such sect. A few months later, uh, there was a particular thread that my mother had given me. It's sort of like a spiritual thread it's called tabis. It's like a talisman. It keeps you safe from illnesses. And I had put it across on my wrist and I went to school very happy thinking that, oh, I've worn this talisman and I'm going to be safe from any danger. The head representative of that class took me aside after a few classes had gone by and she said, what is that black thing on your wrist? What is that thread? And I said, oh, it's a tabis. And she said, oh, don't you know, you're not allowed to wear this because if you wear this, you're going to hell. And I said, why would I go to hell? And she said, oh, because, you know, it's not allowed in the Muslim community. And I said, but I'm Muslim. And my mother told me that I can wear this. To which she said, you know what? I'm going to show you that it's wrong. The next day, she showed me uh, a newspaper in which she had written an entire piece in the opinion uh, op-ed section in which it was written in bold letters that wearing a talisman is haram. And haram, for those of you who don't know, means forbidden in Arabic. And it's a word that is consistently used when you're supposed to understand Islamic laws regarding what is permitted and what is not permitted. Uh, she showcased the entire op-ed article in front of the entire class. She pointed towards me and she said, now do you understand that I'm trying to save you from hell? I was shocked uh, again and I took off the thread. Uh, I put it in my pocket. I went back home and I cried. And I told my mother that this is what happened. And she said that, oh, so now everybody gets to know that you're Shia. And I said, well, I haven't been trying to, you know, market it all across. But my parents were extremely stressed at that point of time. Uh, the more I went to school in Kashmir, um, and the more it subtly came out that, you know, Hamida doesn't really smile during Muharram, or Hamida had that wrist, uh, had that thread that she wore uh, a few months back they stopped drinking from my water bottle because there's this myth. And if you're a Shia, you know about this myth that um, Shias spit on water or on anything related uh, to a liquid before giving it over to someone. So everyone had this idea that I had spit in my water bottle uh, before giving water to uh, my friends or my colleagues. So nobody drank from my water the entire time I was in school. And that was close to six years. 
when I became a freelance journalist um, and I started working with News Laundry, uh, I had to uh, crowdfund for a campaign on uh, the redevelopment of Central Vista uh, to do sort of like an investigative report. Um, I was supposed to go on social media and I was supposed to speak about this report to try and attract funds from our subscribers and from the normal public. When I went online and when my videos came out, uh, there were two kinds of uh, comments. The first comment said that I was a jihadi and terrorist and that I had no uh, business talking about things that didn't uh, need my attention. And interestingly, there was a second kind of comment, mostly by Muslim men and Muslim women, asking me if I knew how to wear the hijab correctly. And I was very surprised by the second kind of comment because I thought that at this point of time, I would have gotten the support and the appreciation that I needed, considering that this was quite a difficult time to be a journalist and especially a visible Muslim journalist. Um, but interestingly, um, I also got a few messages uh, on my Twitter account asking me uh, to wear my hijab correctly. And by that, they sent a photo in which um, there was a woman and she had the entire, uh, her entire face except her eyes veiled, to which they said, dear sister, I hope you're doing well. Please don't take this the wrong way, but this is how you're supposed to wear the hijab. I hope you keep this in mind. It's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. My point in sharing all these three experiences is to put it in context of what Professor Ambar Ahmed has said when she said, number one, who is a Muslim woman? I'm a Muslim woman as well. I wear the hijab. I say all of the prayers that I'm supposed to say. Maybe some of them I do miss, usually the morning one. But there are times where I do remember God in the manner that I've always been taught and in the manner that I do want to. Second, do they need saving? There have been times in my life, either if it's been my teacher, either if it's been my friends or my colleagues, or even if it's been a random people on the internet, they've come up to me and they've said, oh, you know, this is not how you're supposed to do it. You're not supposed to think of God like this. You're not supposed to wear your Muslim identity like this. And the concept of having to be saved consistently has come up in these experiences. And third, who is saving them? In all across the experiences that I've had, it's mostly been the majority sect that has come up, that have come up with their own understanding of how it, what it means to be a Muslim woman. And they've tried to speak about it with me in a manner in which I haven't felt safe. These kind of experiences usually do not, uh, are not spoken about. And as a Shia, I'm probably uh, stopping um, a tradition of secrecy by speaking about it, especially in such a large panel. But the whole idea behind me coming here and sharing these extremely vulnerable and authentic experiences with you is to give you an idea about how different each Muslim woman experiences Islam and how different each Muslim woman considers Muslimness or even being a Muslim means. My experiences have taught me all throughout my life that there is an alternate situation. There is an alternate discourse that I have inside my head. There've been moments where I have tried to repel that discourse within me. But if I had repelled that discourse, I wouldn't be here speaking about all of these experiences to help you understand what it entirely means to be a Muslim woman. So when you put it in the context of Professor Abu Lagod's uh, essay, Do Muslim Women Need Saving? Probably the first question that you need to ask yourself to even understand what it means to save a Muslim woman is that what is it that a Muslim woman wants and experiences? And what is it that a Muslim woman desires from you to be able to support her? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hamida, for that very erudite and articulate uh, uh, expression of the complexities of being a Muslim woman and of being a minority within a minority. I would now like to call upon Sarah to please present your thoughts. Uh, am I audible? Just take a 
Hello. Yes, Sarah, you are audible. Okay. Um, well, I am really thankful to this one that they made such a platform where we are able to uh, listen to experiences of people like me. Then I'm, I'm really grateful um, that we have this space where we are able to listen to people from Shia community. <clears throat> Since I don't belong to uh, that community, but I've had friends, and I think uh, these discussions we should have. There should be more and more platforms to have such discussions. And also, Professor Amber Ahmed, for your incredibly powerful um, presentation. I, I learned a lot um, through it. Uh, and also, I, I, just I just want to thank everyone uh, who's uh, taken time from their schedule to come here and to listen to us. So uh, I just begin. Uh, and I want to begin with a cartoon that was released very recently by the official handle of BJP. It was a Twitter, uh, official Twitter handle of BJP. And in this cartoon, one can see there are three people bringing presents to uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, standing um, in front of a table. And there are three people coming and they are giving him um, presents for the most important contributions that the BJP government has made for the people of India. And the first person is handing him a gift for uh, the application of Article 317 in Kashmir. The second person is bringing him a gift for the Citizenship Act. And the third person presenting uh, the gift to Narendra Modi is a woman who's draped in a burqa, presenting him uh, with a gift for the Triple Talaq uh, Now, there's one more interesting in, uh, event that I'd like to talk about. During the UP elections, when BJP was trying to make rallies in many cities of Uttar Pradesh, and they were trying to make an appeal to different sections of people, uh, in the Muslim section, of course, they weren't uh, uh, expecting much support. So they, it was only the section of Muslim women who they were asking for support. And in one of the speeches, Mr. Modi said, claiming that the BJP government freed Muslim women from the menace of triple talaq, he said, Muslim sisters and daughters understand our intentions. We gave them protection from triple talaq. Now when the BJP received their support, some people, and he means opposition, are getting restless. In fact, uh, the government of India also declared August 1 to be observed as the Muslim Women's Rights Day. It uh, corresponds to the day uh, the parliament passed the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Bill, that is uh, also known as the Triple Talaq Law. And Another very interesting incident is when the application of Article 317 in Kashmir was carried out, uh, there were a lot of stories uh, going around. One very important and interesting story that uh, was going around was that it was a victory for the Kashmiri women uh, who could finally now pass their property to their children if they wished uh, to marry men of non-Kashmiri origin. So like this was a feminist, uh, this, this was also a feminist uh, endeavor that the BJP had taken. So we can clearly see, I mean, I'm mentioning some key instances, but there are of course many instances where we can see that, uh, that how the question of liberation of Muslim women has occupied a very key position in the politics of BJP. And we all know how heavily invested this party is in uh, a propaganda machinery that is focusing, focused on othering Muslims. So their unusual concern towards the liberation of Muslim women does raise some crucial questions. <clears throat> if it is indeed the liberation of Muslim women that they desire, uh, the, then what exactly defines the conditions of the bondage of Muslim women? This is also something that, Ms. that Professor Amr Ahmed was asking. And since it is not all uh, Indian Muslim women, we live in a largely conservative society, so it's not like the rest of the Muslim, rest of the women are somehow free from patriarchy. But only, but it is assumed that it is only Indian Muslim women who require this uh, special assistance. Then it should imply that the condition of their bondage has is has probably something to do with their religious faith. And I think the question of hijab becomes extremely important in this uh, context. <clears throat> In a country where Muslim women as a social group have abysmally low levels of education, the lowest work participation rate among all categories of work in the economy and a marginal presence in salary job, the move of hijab does raise uh, 
uh, some questions on the intentions of a government that is working so hard to advertise itself as the savior uh, of the Muslim world. We are also seeing the news on Iran already making impacts in India. In fact, the case was also cited in the Supreme Court to hold the decision on hijab ban in school. There's hardly any mention of the fact that the battle that Iranian women have taken up is also against a dictatorial state that seeks to take away the bodily autonomy of women by enforcing the correct way to dress, pretty much the same way that Indian Muslim women are also being uh, subjected to. It's a bit ironical if you um, if you Google uh, any cartoons that come out of the BJP cell, uh, and if you look at the representation that they make of Muslim women, there's there's always a veil put around her. Any cartoon you pick, it's almost as if they cannot imagine Muslim women outside the veil. It's almost as if the Muslim woman somehow stops becoming Muslim to them uh, once her veil is off. And it has been seen historically that stereotypes which distinguish uh, the, well, the racialized other from central subject, here the central subjects being Hindus, are grounded in what are held to be the identifying features of the racial minorities. So, there, so these features of wearing the wheel is almost seen like, <clears throat> like, a, like a body part. Almost invariably, these stereotypes are loaded with disparaging associations, suggesting inferiority and non-humanness. Consequently, they provide both motive and rationale for injurious uh, verbal and physical assaults on the minority groups. While the Karnatic issue was very much in the news um, at, the, uh, at the time, other than the, the clips of Muskan that were making a lot of rounds, there was also this one other kind of uh, clip that was uh, making rounds, and uh, these were clips of those uh, many teachers and students who were standing outside uh, the school, and before entering, they had to take their hijab off. And there were loads of these uh, videos being circulated in the right wing of the chamber. It was almost being seen as a, it was almost being taken as a fetish to see uh, Muslim women uh, removing hijab. And crying while doing it. Um, there's, there was uh, also another video that was uh, this is some this from some time back uh, during Holi. There was another video release in which one Muslim woman can be seen praying, and while she's praying, she's put her hijab on, and then suddenly there is a Hindu man that comes and he puts uh, a holy color on her. And first she's seen upset, but then she um, takes her hijab off and uh, put that puts that color on on the Hindu man. Uh, so we see there is not one but almost two underlying connected assumptions here. Where the hijab is not just seen as an identity marker, but it is seen as the identity marker that has kept Muslim women subjugated under the Muslim man. And the act of liberation is thus imagined in this case to be the intervention of a Hindu man uh, in our specific context at least. And the removal of a hijab is seen as something that distances her from her faith. The underlying condition uh, of, uh, for, for her freedom itself is presumed to be a weakening of her religious faith. And naturally, any clothing that she wears or any uh, symbols that she adorns are taken as markers of the, the value system that she is in a way submitting to. So this politics of saviorship, the same thing that uh, Professor Amber and the was talking about, is therefore nothing less than a battle for her psychological ownership. Her body becomes a site of conquest, of violation and of humiliation and her submission to an alternative, uh, alternative culture of patriarchy in this case, it is the removal of hijab, is taken as a reinforcement of control over the Muslim population. I think I'd like to end with this. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, a couple of very brief comments on the presentations before we move on to the questions. Uh, Hamida's presentation and the ideas that she has shared have highlighted very beautifully, first of all, that we really cannot be talking about a homogeneous category of Muslim women. Forget it 
across the globe, even within our own country, when we speak about Muslim women, or for that matter, when we even speak about visibly Muslim women in terms of veiling, we, such, we see such a massive variety from the chadar to the burqa, to the abaya, to hijab, to a headscarf, to a dupatta, to the burqa worn by Bohra women. So in that sense, homogeneity or hom any kind of homogenizing discourse is doomed to fail from the very outset. The other thing is that it also points out what Hamida has spoken about also highlights how majoritarianism can play out in many ways. So while uh, there is one kind of majoritarianism that is in relation to being a Muslim in India, in terms of the majority community, the Hindu community, there is also another kind of majoritarianism that can play out within the context of the Islamic community as well. So being a minority within the Islamic community, being a Shia within the Islamic community is also an experience of being a minority. Now, very interestingly, uh, being a Shia Muslim myself also, this is like many of these things resonated with me. And also uh, it reminded me of a discourse that is very common that often in India, uh, before things became as bad as they are today, so obviously bad as they are in the present circumstances, we often heard elders in the family say that as Shias, we are perhaps much better off in a country which is not really a Muslim majority country. So to be a Shia in India, to be uh, particularly during the uh, months of Muharram and Safar, are, uh, you are relatively safer than being a Shia out on the streets of Pakistan or in Kabul or in Saudi Arabia for that instance where you have to constantly hide and mask your identity. So yes, majoritarianism can play out in different ways and uh, demographic matters. So it could well be that they could be a Shia majority country or they could be a Sunni majority country or they could be a Wahhabi country like Saudi Arabia. So there are many dimensions to the lived experience of being a Muslim. Uh, the other thing is also, uh, something very interesting, the supposed degrees of Muslimness. And uh, what you pointed out, Hamida, reminded me of an incident that I had read of that uh, one very concerned brother uh, suggesting to a hijabi woman that sister, your hijab is not adequate. This is not the way you should be wearing your hijab or you need to cover better or cover more or whatever, to which she turned around and responded, brother, lower your eyes because that is also a very primary Islamic injunction related to hijab, that while it may well be that what you consider to be a, a, an inadequate hijab, you also have the option of averting your gaze or turning your eyes from it instead of simply uh, exhorting the other to enhance what you consider to be the degree of their Muslimness. So there, there is this entire um, you know, spectrum of what is seen as acceptable clothing and there is a policing both within the society, uh, like within the community and from without as well, which we need to take into account. Sarah, your uh, question, like the question that you highlighted that in India also, when you, when the political narrative about the Muslim woman is put forth, there is a very typical, stereotypical understanding of who constitutes the Muslim woman. Now, of course, the burqa clad woman is the stuff that dream posters are made of. When political posters have to be created, then the burqa clad woman is absolutely an essential ingredient because how otherwise will Narendra Modi project himself as the savior of Muslim women in India? But then again, the same point that while he will present himself as the savior of the victims of triple talaq, and there is a lot of work on, uh, on that as well, well in terms of what have been the implications of that law in terms of criminalization. We don't have time to go into that. But also, which Muslim woman do you champion? You champion the uh, victim of triple talaq. You champion those who are uh, considered to be victims of Islamic patriarchy. But when it comes to a Bilqis Bano, she does not have a champion. So in that sense, it's a very selective outrage. It is very selective sympathy. Or, uh, and so in other words, we can very uh, easily say that in order to, it's, it's when you fit into that narrative that you are going to be extended a certain kind of conditional political sympathy, right? Uh, which has nothing to do with the well being of the supposed victim and everything to do with the political narrative at hand. So you have to be the perfect Muslim woman victim in order to feature on that poster. Uh, also, the moment the Muslim woman is articulate, 
assertive and uncowed then she's a danger then she is somebody who has to be handled accordingly so uh, she may well be auctioned online or she may be stripped of the hijab as a as a woman who wears the hijab i remember that when i saw those videos of women who were being forced to strip their hijab to take off their hijab in public before they were able to enter into their schools educational institutions or workplaces it was heartbreaking and it was the capacity for empathy immediately leads a person to imagine yourself in that position and i could not imagine what a person has to go through where you live in a free country and you are forced into a position where you are asked to take off any article of clothing it's not just about the hijab the point is whether it is the imposition of an article clothing or whether it is the forcible removal of an article of of clothing it is something that should not happen to any woman now here i would also like to add one thing that uh, i had recently been uh, writing a book chapter in which i was looking at the controversy about the hijab and in that i had uh, looked at some of the online narratives regarding it so very interestingly there is a juxtaposition of the ghungat and the hijab in which it is said no ghungat is an adorable custom which is only meant for married women if they wish to then they need to abide by it while burqa by its very definition is burying a woman completely alive now uh, interestingly enough the hijabi women being targeted as uh, sara pointed out the hijabi women being targeted these are women who are going to educational institutions they are articulate they are trying to get an education they are trying to make a life for themselves the education is the first step towards self reliance financial independence their capacity to be able to assert themselves in all kinds of situation within the family and without and it is these women that constitute the biggest danger if it is a nameless faceless victim in a burqa then she is perfectly acceptable if it is a woman in a burqa who's trying to acquire an education along with assertion of identity that is the moment in which she becomes particularly dangerous to the narrative of the indian right wing uh so which is why the indian right wing rejoicing in the iranian women's resistance to the imposition of the veil is something that reminds me of what lord cromer did in egypt lord cromer of britain is somebody who in egypt was championing the cause of feminism on behalf of egyptian women mm-hmm. while back at home mm-hmm. he was the uh, founding member of the men's league for opposition to women's suffrage so this kind of uh, feminism becomes justifiably suspect and uh, what for example women in iran who are resisting the compulsory imposition of the veil one of the slogans that they are using is uh, hijab e ikhtiyari which basically means that hijab as a matter of choice that those who wish to take it on should be should have the choice to take it on and who those who do not wish to wear it it should not be imposed upon them so the same right wing that is celebrating the iranian uh, women's resistance to the imposition of the hijab would obviously not abide by the slogan of hijab e ikhtiyari which basically means hijab by choice for those who wish to and no imposition for those who do not wish to finally i'll wrap it up quickly that lived experiences matter lived experiences matter and in this sense uh an academic debate about what the hijab means an academic de- academic debate about uh, whether it is oppressive or whether is it it is emancipatory these are binaries binaries don't help ultimately lived experiences are far more complicated and complex not everyone who every woman who is wearing a hijab is necessarily wearing the hijab for exactly the same set of reasons so uh, that's one set of complications but just one final point two final points actually i'll ask you to bear with me one is that uh, what sara spoke about also reminded me of the work of franz fanon franz fanon in algeria unveiled when he looks at the anti colonial uh, thing is uh, resistance in algeria uh, so uh, this taking off of the hijab this forcible removal of the hijab it is not about the liberation of the woman as much as it is a power play in case of algeria of the colonizer that the, the that capacity so um, fanon points out that this uh, the the veiled woman by her very presence 
is for the colonizer a barrier of invisibility there is a certain resistance that is implicit in her unwillingness to show herself which has to be ripped away from her for the colonial project to succeed and i would like to end with reference to one very interesting case in india of khatija rehman khatija rehman is the daughter of ar rehman and she was trolled very badly on social media some time back about like more than i think it's nearly 2 years now for a photograph that was put out in which she is veiled now her sister is not veiled the mother wears a light dupatta but the entire right wing ecosystem went after her on the assumption that out of the three women in ar rehman's family khatija rehman alone is the one that has been brainwashed so uh, this automatic assumption that the veiled woman cannot possibly be exerting any agency or choice is something that is highly problematic as is any assumption that the veiled woman simply by virtue of her veil is automatically a good muslim or um, by that standard automatically very pious etc so thank you very much hamida and sara this was uh, an excellent session and uh, many you you put forth many points that were very thought provoking many things that i had like thought of but i would not have been able to articulate it as well as you did so i would now like to hand it over to shilpi to please handle the question answer session shilpi thank you very much ambar for sharing such evocative insights and truly distilling key ideas from both hamid and sara's brilliant presentation so incisively uh, i know we are running a little behind time but we really hope to open the floor now to the larger community to ask questions and share reflections on the ideas that have been generated in this space um i invite you to raise your hands using the icon in the bottom panel of your screen uh to ask questions and please keep your questions and uh, reflections under a minute so we can hear from maximum number of people uh once you raise your hands i'll call on you to speak and perhaps we can begin with uh, introducing ourselves to the community uh gul mathur can i invite you to ask your question hi thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity i would just like to mention one small question when uh, one of the speakers mentioned franz fanon uh, they talk about violence in their book and violence in resistant movements and in decolonization movements so uh, i'm so sorry i can't switch on my video right now but uh, coming back to my question uh, i feel that i want to talk about how that fits into movements like these that emphasize on women rights and especially vi- muslim women's rights uh so emphasis on the violence and that entire thought that was generated in that book i would want more thoughts on uh, by any of the speakers on it thank you gul if you have any other questions please uh, use the reaction icon in the bottom panel of your screen within that there's the raise your hand button you can also type in your questions in the q and a box meanwhile akash lena would you like to ask your question thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you ma'am for these presentation thank you it's really difficult to use words to describe what one feels and is thinking to your thoughts and insight akash lena you're not very audible Okay. Is this is this fine? It's slightly better. Is this working fine now? Thank you. So, um, why have we understood this is the savior complex which is often used in terms of saving the children? Akash, can I? You're still not audible. Yeah. Perhaps you can try plugging yeah. out the headphone and plugging it in again. Meanwhile, if people have more questions, please feel free to type them out or raise your hands. We also have a question from Aksa Jan, who's asked that she'd like to know the presenters and Amber's thoughts on the Muslim women's representation in general discourse. Somebody's also asked a question about looking at the hijab. as a symbol of resistance um these are some of the questions that we have so far
uh, yeah, I, I could come in if uh, it's okay, Shilpi. Absolutely, Amber, go ahead. So to the question about Fanon and violence, uh, Hanon basically talks about violence as something that is a kind of psychological necessity. For him, colonialism is not simply a project of political domination. It is a project that also leads to the psychological submission of the colonized. And his argument is also that there's a certain internalization of the violence, physical as well as structural, that then there is a certain chain. So the man who moves about in the world, it becomes a victim of the violence of the colonizer. And this is an internalized violence that then he takes back and he uh, takes it out on the family to a certain extent. So uh, Fanon says that uh, for any kind of true liberation to take place, uh, he is somebody who invokes the necessary sort of uh, do away with the psychological impact of colonialism colonialism, and therefore his entire discourse about guerrilla warfare and all that. Now, when we speak about uh, violence and resistance in context of the women's movement, uh, here I would also like to bring in another dimension, uh, which is um, derived, uh, which has a parallel in the experience of black women in America as well. So in the 1960s, when you had the rise of the radical feminist ideas, one of the most powerful critiques came from black feminism. And uh, the, the position was also that in terms of lived experiences of being victims of violence, et cetera, black women had far more in common with black men than they had with white middle-class women in terms of their what they were facing in context of racism, in context of various kinds of violence, overt as well as structural and covert. So in that sense, when we are speaking about women's resistance and violence, we first have to problematize the question and try to understand it that violence against whom or what it, exactly. So uh, as I said, that in most of the narratives, there is this pitting of Muslim women in relation to Muslim men, right? That Muslim men as oppressors and Muslim women as victims, right? So if we are looking at it purely in terms of resistance at that level, then we do need to remember, if we take into account, let's say, uh, the circumstances right now, that there is a lot in common in terms of being Muslims in India, <laughs> rather than just the binary of being Muslim women as victims and Muslim men as oppressors. When it comes to the question of any potential violence, uh, resist, resist, resi uh, re resistance violence against the state, um, it would, uh, be instructive to remember that Muslim women, if we speak about Amber, your video is chosen. So uh, narratives of protection, etc., by default kick in and uh, they restrict mobility, choices, opportunities, et cetera, in a way that further make life difficult. We, uh, so here uh, the question is that, do you really, and uh, can we really blame the Muslim man who in an attempt to be to study in far off cities in the present political climate where they'll be staying in a hostel, et cetera. They'll be staying quote unquote unprotected. So these are complex issues. When we speak about violence, we have to also sort of recognize that uh, it's, it may be structural, it may be economic, it may be covert, it may be overt, but somewhere or the other that ever present possibility of the breakout of overt violence in India and Many other parts of the world, for that matter, have had a very long history of it. So that complicates the situation. The uh, other thing is somebody asked about hijab and resistance. This is something um, documented by Fadwa El Gwindi, the anthropologist. She has an excellent book that I would highly recommend, which is titled Veil, 
uh, modesty, privacy, resistance. So these are the three tropes that she has employed to talk about veiling. Uh, so she says that one aspect of it is modesty. So the whole idea of the veil as carrying the private, even when you are moving outside the home, so kind of portable seclusion or a kind of mobile home. Uh, the other uh, thing that she's pointed out is the notion of piety uh, uh, and uh, like modesty and piety as related and then uh, privacy and resistance. So in context of resistance, she has at length looked at the experience of Algeria and the anti-colonial movement there that veil as uh, so. Uh, we do have to recognize also that there are many contexts in which the veil has been invoked as a form of resistance. Uh, so, for instance, the Iranian women have, within the span of a century, been subjected not just to the imposition of compulsory veiling, but also the uh, removal of the veil compulsorily. So Raza Shah Pehelvi's regime had ordered women to remove their veils and men were also not allowed to wear uh, religious clothing. And this is this is replicated in some other contexts as well. So this compulsory de-veiling and compulsory veiling in a context where you have compulsory de-veiling or compulsory unveiling of women, the veil can very well serve as a form of resistance as it did also in Algeria. But uh, so as I said, that in a span of a century, both they have gone through both experiences. They have had an imposition of the veil against their choice for many of them. And many Iranian women also had the compulsory removal of the veil again against their choice, which you also need to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambar. Hamida Sara, would you like to come in and share any reflections? Meanwhile, we also have a question um, as we are gathering them, uh, where somebody is asking about the experience, the agendas and the role of uh, Muslim women's engagement with the wider women's movement in India and South Asia. Um, I think people want to learn and understand a little more about that. There are some questions that have also come directly to me. I'll read them out. Akashina, you have your hand raised. Would you like to share something or ask a question? Okay, uh, is the audio fine right now? All right, all right, thank you so much. Um, so as, as we also throughout these presentations uh, spoke about how there's a savior complex coming in, how there's a cherry picking of who's a good Muslim women in a particular context. Uh, you know, we also realized that this entire discourse of saving Muslim women is couched in the vocabulary of choice, consent, freedom and rights. And yet we also see how the protest movements and resistance movements use this, this particular language of, again, consent, freedom and rights. So I was actually thinking about, now how do we, do we have any alternative form of expression or alternative form of language? Uh, instead of using this typical uh, liberal idea of choice consent, which is often used to, uh, you know, appropriate the voices which protest against, uh, against the patriarchal, uh, the power uh, complex relations and and all these structures as well like how do we really like, do we still use this particular language of rights which is often used to oppress and suppress the experiential realities of women i think that this was what was uh, going on in my mind it's probably not a question but i'm probably also um, thinking out loud because on the one hand we see how the language of choice itself is so complex like as uh, ma'am also pointed out that we can't just use that a, a woman chooses to do this. There are contextual specificities which also need to be taken into account. How do we then talk about this particular language, which is uh, which is used so, or like which is used widespread in, in terms of the discourses and in every, uh, in, even in academic settings as well. So I hope uh, any any of the speakers, if they would have any reflections, and we could also go ahead with the questions which are there. Maybe you have your hand up. Please, please yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for first of all for the questions and for the outpouring of love uh, from all of the speakers and from uh, the audience that is listening in. Um, I am extremely intrigued by Akash Lina's question because um, so I'm doing a piece for the Third Eye Social, which is a feminist portal. Uh, I'm doing a piece on religion and education and uh, my experiences surrounding them, and in one part of the piece I write about um, my experience with religion as compared to my sister's experience with religion. So my immediate sister uh, does not veil. Um, and 
there was a point in time where when she came up with that decision um she went up to my parents and she said that i've decided that i don't want to wail uh and this is my decision um at that point of time a very prominent um family member who is related to the religious shia political space in kashmir was coming to visit us um and my parents were understandably very very afraid because they said okay at this point of time you want to take such a step and it's at this point of time that this particular leader is coming to meet us so we don't know what is going to happen uh my sister uh, stayed with the decision my parents respected it um when the leader and his family came in to uh, to meet us uh my sister came inside and usually seeing my sister in her veil not being in her veil was a shock for a lot of people within that particular space um they immediately looked towards my mother uh and they asked um where is her hijab to which my mother responded with a verse from the quran uh there is no compulsion in religion so when we talk about discourses and as you rightly pointed out akash lena when we talk about liberal discourses um and how there is always the concept of choice freedom uh consent involved uh, i believe that this particular experience um contextualizes how the concept of free will is seen even by a lot of muslim women who probably are not able to say it in terms of the binaries of patriarchy but are able to explicitly feel it and to some extent imply it through their spiritual understanding of god so my mother's stance at that time a feminist solidarity stance uh, was enough for me to understand that um, even at this point of time the diverse realities that exist between my mother my sister and i can be fused together within this very one particular phrase uh you know as given by god which is there is no compulsion in religion so thank you thank you very much meeta sara please go ahead i'm also very intrigued by the question that akashina had um, or rather the comment that akashina made i don't have a very long comment to make but i just want to say that this is a very important point that she raises that uh, we always frame these questions in uh, terms of choice and consent and while of course it is about choice and content but it is content but it is not just about that the element of state violence that is on muslims completely gets erased in the background which is doing this to the muslim women and it is not just the muslim women woman who is the victim in this case it is also the muslim man who is being indirectly targeted we trying to say this is what we are going to do to your women this is what uh, indirect uh, implication they have so i think um a language that encompasses these um, these parts uh, of uh, embedded islamophobia in these things should also be uh, sort of brought to the forefront this is not just a simplistic question of patriarchy this is uh, much more complex than that and i think we need to definitely improve our language uh, when we are addressing these uh, questions with this thank you thank you very much sara uh, maybe there's one last question that we can uh, take and ask of the panel post which i'll hand over to uh, our colleague from project demilitarized to make the concluding remarks there's a question in the chat box which is asked by maitri she says it will be very helpful to understand from the panel what non muslims can be mindful of while standing in solidarity especially using visual art and ambar uh, sara hamida i invite any of you to please take this on um shilpi i wasn't able to figure out how to raise my hand so uh, if i may uh, just add very briefly to the previous uh, thing about the whole what akash lena had mentioned the language of rights and choice and all that so uh, one of the path breaking works in this relation has been that of saba mehmood Saba Mehmood, uh, anthropologist of Pakistani origin, who conducted her fieldwork across decades in Egypt. So, what she studied was what she has termed the voluntary Islamization of women's lives. So, her primary question was that why would women women choose of their free will? All these questions, obviously, with all the problems attached, uh, these terminologies. 
that why would women voluntarily choose to islamize their lives why would women voluntarily choose practices that impose a certain kind of discipline upon what they can or cannot do and she her, her work is fascinating in the context of how she problematizes the notion of choice and how she speaks about what she calls the architecture of desire so she says that when we speak about agency we usually make an implicit assumption that agency is always about resistance to norms when she says that agency may well at times be about inhabiting certain norms and the example that she uses is is that of a person who wishes to learn to how to play the piano so she says that somebody who wants to learn is also somebody who has to then give up her agency and give herself over to the teacher who is then going to impose a regimen that you have to follow in order to ultimately be able to acquire your goal of being able to master the art of playing the piano so agency is not something that can only be seen in terms of action particularly resistive action agency may also be about inhabiting certain norms and creating a certain kind of self so uh, though the, the philosophical discourse in ethics about the kind of self that so for instance mahmud writes that the veiled woman it is not that the veil is an expression of her piety it is also that by veiling she is simultaneously constructing the pious self it's a kind of two way process so it is in this context that she says that this automatic assumption that the liberatory goals of western feminism are a priori the goals that every single woman across the globe would aspire to is something we need to problematize there are many different ways in which we can understand the notion of agency and choice agency and choice are not just about resisting certain aspects simply by virtue of the fact that they impose a discipline upon your life so i just wanted to sort of highlight that so those of you who are interested could explore saba mehmood's work further her book is titled politics of piety thank you ambar hamida sara any uh, comments from you uh, i've just shared uh, the instagram uh, link for uh, one of the um, artists uh, they're based i think in uh, the west but um they they're very interesting in the sense that uh, he reimagines traditional shia symbols so uh, there's there's a very um there's a very simple way of depicting what happens in muharram but what he does is that he reimagines it uh in the context of how he looks at shia islam uh i know this is not exactly what maitri was looking for but i thought that there are uh there might be some insights that they might gain from this because um what he essentially does is that he makes you expand your own understanding of what shia islam could be for you spiritually and especially for someone who does not want uh, who who is not part of that particular faith they can find some similarities some common elements uh, because what he also does is that he fuses two or three different uh, religious symbols together so maybe maitri can find some common element that they'll be able to find inspiration from so i I've, i've shared that in the chat thank you for that question thank you so much amida and sara any last remarks from you Okay, okay, Sarah. So I now invite uh, Lamia Tanzin Tanha. She's joining us from Bangladesh, and she's the co-founder of Project Demolishers. To share very briefly some concluding remarks. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Shilpi. Right. So I'm Lamia Tanzin Tanha, and uh, one of the co-founders from Project Demolishers, and uh, from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Thanks to Professor Amber Hamid. Diane Sara uh, a lot of uh, very interesting and amazing insights that I got from all of you concluding today's session very very briefly um, so professor amber started today's session uh, with three very interesting questions with the context of lila abu lagot's book do muslim women at saving the are who is this muslim women that we are talking of savings do they need saving and uh, 
from what and number three who will save them um, and then Hamida started her uh, experiences as Professor Ambar called it the experience of being a minority among the minority Hamida shared the unfortunate challenges that she had to face being a Shia since childhood um, and regarding the uh, the myths about the Shia community regarding the religious science the bees, and the supposed degrees of Muslimness that is practiced in different location regarding Muslim women. Uh, this reminds me of the experiences of uh, one of my Muslim Bangladeshi friends uh, that she faced in Thailand some months ago. So she was uh, very briefly, I'm sharing the story, like she was in this uh, mart and uh, she was wearing uh, salwar kameez and was having the um, orna as, as a veil. And there's this, uh, uh, two white people who approached her and 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 she was just you know like my friend was just looking for something in the shop and those two people came to my friend asking hey are you lost hey do you need any help and then my friend was like no i don't need any help it's it's fine and they were sort of you know <laughs> like um sort of gaslighting her that well she needs to need the help or something yeah so and also later on um when Sarah Alter was answering Amber's questions, highlighting the politics of ruling and imposing on what women should wear. And uh, she also uh, was highlighting two underlying uh, connection regarding it. This reminded me of my another own experience of mine, which is um, again in, in Thailand. Um, so I was in the Uber and um, as a tourist, so the Uber driver was sort of trying to communicate with me having a friendly conversation and at one point he asked me where, where I'm from when I said that I'm from Bangladesh and I am a Muslim he was he was very surprised because you know I wasn't wearing any hijab and I had like different hair color uh, and I was wearing a, a midi dress so he was like oh no you, you cannot be a Muslim maybe you're a Christian or something and he showed me the pictures like look, these are my passengers from Malaysia and Indonesia. They're wearing hijab. They're good Muslims. You are a bad Muslim. So that, um, again, uh, that I was very hard. I mean, I'm not wearing hijab. That doesn't mean that I'm a bad Muslim. And also how dangerous uh, the, um, the Western media that, we, that the uh, panelists also uh, shared. And, and also, I just want to share about this. I don't know if you have watched Netflix uh, Elite. There's this series. And um, I have noticed that this, there's this one character called uh, Nadia. How uh, how like she was she 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 was this Muslim character. And there's this one point in the uh, series where she is uh, you know removing her uh, hijab, and it's sort of uh, as Sarah said, like fetishizing the um, Muslim women when they were removing their hijab, uh, and indirectly how that. Uh, that episode is, is showing that how liberating uh, removing the hijab is, which is not. I mean, I'm someone personally who used to wear hijab for a very long time. And then I, I myself just decided not to wear it. That doesn't mean that I felt more liberated. I felt the, the same liber liberated before wearing the hijab and, and removing the hijab. So yeah, so closing my remark, <laughs> resonating on what Hamida said before assuming whether or uh, whether or how Muslim women need savings, ask yourself what a Muslim woman wants or desires that you do support her. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Tanha. And we are running short of time, so I'm going to quickly thank um, all of you for being such a wonderful audience. I need to definitely thank the panel, Professor Ambar Ahmed, Hamida, and Sara for your reflections, insights, and the questions we were raised. Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, we couldn't address a lot of questions, so I will take this opportunity to request all of you to write to us. Write to us at wiscomp at 20 at the gmail.com or visit our website and login gender and our social media handles to you know, share your questions, your reflections. We will definitely share a reading list after this session, maybe uh, early next week. Along with that, we'll also upload the recording of this uh, video online. and. Um, also, I would like to thank the entire team of Project Team Literize for collaborating uh, with us. And none of this would have been possible without the support and guidance of uh, Dr. Gopinath, uh, Mr. Rajiv Mehrotra, uh, the wonderful team of Viscomp and FUR, Seema Kakran, Shilpi Shabdita, 
Diksha Poddar, Anukriti Prasad, and Jamya. Thank you so much. And uh, this is finally the end of the second edition of the Book Cafe. So do let us know what would be the next book you would want us to discuss. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.